Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, for today's webinar. My name is Trevor Terrell. I serve as uh, Vice President of Sales here at Innovator ETS. And uh, today we're going to be discussing our, our suite of defined outcome products, uh, which are the first ETFs to provide market exposure with built-in buffers of either 9, 15, or 30 percent. And uh, today's call is mostly going to focus on application of these strategies. And we're going to be talking about different ways to use them and overall asset allocation. And as you can see, they're one of those ways is actually replacing other structures like a structured note uh, for risk management. So a uh, quick housekeeping item, we will be having Q&A at the end of the call, so feel free to submit those throughout the webinar, and we'll address those questions at the end, as long as we have time. Uh, excited to be joined today uh, on the call with Alan Harris, who is the founder, CEO, and CIO of Berkshire Money Management, RA, uh, out of uh, Massachusetts, and he's going to be pro providing his perspective on the market and how he's analyzing and using to find out from ETFs uh, here in a little bit as well as uh, Wes Matthews, and Wes is director at Milliman Financial Risk Management, a great partner of ours, and actually Milliman is a sub-advisor to our defined outcome ETFs. A quick note on Innovator, so we manage currently around $1.7 billion in ETF assets, and we really have a legacy in the ETF industry uh, from our, our leaders and founders here at Innovator, which are Bruce Bond and John Southern. If those names ring a bell, they were actually uh, the founders of PowerShares and really kind of cemented their legacy in the industry as launching the first smart beta ETFs. Um, grew PowerShares to become the fourth largest ETF provider, uh, sold to Invesco in 06, and, and now we're back in the industry really because of the need that we see for defined outcome investing, uh, especially within an ETF vehicle. So that leads me into why we're here. You know, why did we decide to launch to find outcome ETFs and bring them to market? Um, you see the stat there. I mean, risk management has been a need for a long time. And as the stat implies, 75% of the wealth here in this country is estimated to be in the hands of retirees or pre-retirees uh, in the next year. So that's significant. So that demand is only increasing. And frankly, the ways, a lot of popular ways to get that downside protection comes in the form of either annuities that are issued by insurance companies uh, or structured notes that, that are issued by banks. And we just see a lot of flaws in those structures. And, and really what we're here today and what we're doing in the market is launching ETFs, leveraging the benefits of that structure with no credit risk, the liquidity, uh, the low fees and no surrender charges, really providing what those other investment vehicles have done for a long time, just in what we believe uh, to be a better structure. So what does that look like today? Uh, so we've launched, like I said, the first defined outcome ETFs. So you can see the different buffer levels there of 9, 15, or 30 uh, percent. Those three different levels are currently on the S&P 500, and we're launching each of those monthly. And as you can see right there in the middle, we have also launched the first international versions uh, with a 15 percent buffer on both the emerging markets and also the international developed. In this next slide, just a quick snapshot of what a defined outcome looks like for you using our 15% buffer example. It just shows how you can essentially shape your risk profile before you put your money to work, before you actually make an investment or hope that you get some downside protection from an active manager or your diversification, whatever it may be. These ETFs really allow you to know before you put that money to work what you can expect based off what the market does. So you can see how the 15% buffer would do in an up, neutral, or even a negative market. So I'll turn things over to Alan Harris uh, here from Berkshire Money Management, and uh, we'll circle back with you here at the end of the call. Alan, you. Thank you. Uh, I am Alan Harris of Berkshire Money Management, and I wanted to um, tell you a little about how we're using the Innovator Funds, and I thought one of the best ways to do that was to first give some background to our firm, it'll, I believe, give some context of how we're applying it. Um, we are a registered investment advisor, registered uh, or uh, regulated through the SEC. We've been around about 20 years, have about $550 million of assets under management. And when we started the firm, we started it with a number of financial publications that tracked Fidelity and Vanguard mutual funds specifically. Uh, over time, we sold those off and used fewer and fewer mutual funds 
and became much heavier in the use of exchange traded funds. And we've probably been pretty much all uh, with, with some some foreign entities every now and then. We've been pretty, pretty much all ETFs for well over a decade at this point. So we've uh, we've we're, we're drinking the Kool Aid there for all the reasons that probably everyone on this call are, are familiar with. One of the way, one of the times we were not using ETFs was back in 2007 and then early part of 2008. We um, will we'll proclaim to be more lucky than good, but we wanted to start getting defensive in anticipation of what we thought was going to be a bit of a rocky market. And so as early as June 2007 and then heavily all the way in through up until about March of 2018, we purchased a, a great deal of structured products, um, probably a, a couple hundred million dollars because we sold some expired, uh, matured, and then we use the proceeds to buy more. Uh, so for us, it was a, you know, we bought more than we had under management just because of the maturity and then the repurchase of it. For us, it was very attractive um, because of the way structured products are created. And for us, it was a, a, a type of product we relied most heavily on was something called absolute return CDs. And without getting too into the weeds of how those are created, essentially about a zero coupon CD Say for 95 bucks, you bought two dollars worth of puts, two dollars worth of calls, and then a buck went to the bank. And if you you could have a one year maturity, for example, and if the market went up to 20 percent but not over, you got all the returns on the upside. If the market went down 20 percent but not over, you got all the returns that happened to occur in the downside. And they were exceptional products, extremely well received by our clients because they were unique, they were FDA insured. But the beauty of them was the fact that the insurance, I'm sorry, the interest rates were so high back then. You had all that extra room in the $95 CD, that zero coupon CD, to shove in all those extra puts and calls. And whether it's an absolute return, return CD or other structured products, you don't have that availability for the value anymore. And there's a, you know, I think you can take any type of investment, you can look at the pros and the cons, whether it happens to be taxes or risks or what have you. For me, I like that range of buffer and that range of opportunity on the upside. And in the very low interest rate environment we have right now, you have to go out not one year, but five, six, seven years on structured products to even begin getting something meaningful when you bust out of those, those barriers or a lot of those structured products are contingent upon a whole set of fairly complex triggers of sometimes obscure, sometimes well-known indices and, and if-then type of situations. And even if there are some better products, they're wholeheartedly unfamiliar, our clients are wholeheartedly unfamiliar with them and, and not very receptive to that. It took us a while to move from mutual funds to exchange traded funds. And nowadays that seems like a crazy conversation to have, why wouldn't you, especially if you're using mutual funds nowadays. But 10 years ago, not many people were thinking about ETFs. People didn't know what ETFs were. So we had to have that conversation to even move over to those. When we had the conversation about the absolute return, return CDs, i.e. The, uh, the, the structured products, we had to make sure that people understood what those were. So now we have a combination of those real weird oddities. You have to be very complex and go out a very long time and hold them for a long time. They're very illiquid. So if you're holding for one year, you can get out of them in a year. If you're holding for five years, you know, good luck trying to get out of them, quite frankly. And th that's just not something that clients want to deal with. And it's not something that I want to deal with if all of a sudden I see a new opportunity and the structure note broke and somehow it's going to essentially be worthless. I'll get my money back, but now I have to hold on to it unless I can find some way to, to sell it. It's not, they're not, it's just not liquid. So for us, what we like to do is be fairly passive in our investing. We, use, we generally use, and I know it doesn't sound like that, but generally we have this sort of core and satellite strategy. If the market is giving us singles, we'll take singles. The market's taking doubles, we'll take the doubles. We don't need to be too exotic to, 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 to wow and be fancy for our clients. The use of structured products and the use of innovator funds are not wow type of um, tools. They're, for, for me, 
safety tools with the opportunity to still capture the upside if, quite frankly, I'm wrong in, under, in thinking that I need the safety. So yes, passive when the market's doing well, but when we feel there's gonna be some kind of tumultuous moments in the market, and quite frankly, um, we've been prognosticating for a while that there's probably gonna be a recession around 2020. We've been using that number, that date. And if you look at, for example, Duke Fukula's study of CFOs, you know, something like 73, 74% of CFOs think there could be a recession that starts in 2020. So I, I admit that I'm a bit of a consensus right now, which generally I don't like to be, but if you're gonna be in a consensus, the CFOs of corporate America are the ones you want to be the part of the consensus with because they're the ones making financial decisions and their sentiment will drive which way um, CapEx spending goes, what manufacturing looks like. So right now, we, we're we concerned that we're going to have more bumps in the road. Today, the Dow is down 700 points. That One day does not necessarily a trend make, but it, it, it speaks to that concern. But we're passive investors because you look at the statistics, active investors don't do a great job relative to the benchmarks. Similarly, econometricians, their record of calling recessions, not necessarily stellar themselves. So I don't want to suggest that I have some wizardry that is possessed by myself and, and not my colleagues. So I want to begin to be prepared for what I think is going to be um, a down market, but I realize my limitations and the limitations of all the economists out there in terms of, quite frankly, getting that right. So the innovator products allow me what I couldn't do, what I used to be able to do with structured products, which is say, dear client, we want to participate if the market's going to go up. However, we want to protect you if it does go down. We don't want to raise all cash and hold all cash because if the market goes up, we're going to lose out. Lose out. We don't want to own just all bonds right now because you, you, can, you can make some gamble, quite frankly, on the appreciation or depreciation, but the yield doesn't cover much of the possible depreciation if you, if you get things wrong. So let's go ahead and have a conversation about this new, pun intended, innovative tool that we can put into your portfolio. And the reception by clients has been as well received as they were for the absolute return notes. And by the way, back then, very simple conversation to have about what those were. Just like I said, I do, you know, a zero coupon CD and you shove in some stocks and options, the bank makes a little bit of money. Now they are much more complex, um, not well received in conversation by clients, uh, not easy to track in terms of what their pricing is, and hard to get rid of if you need to. And you can't just wait until maturity because, well, you can, but you might have to wait five, six, seven years. So our clients are loving these products because they say, great, you're looking out for me. You're being proactive. You're realizing that, that I do have needs, wants, and wishes that we need to fulfill on the upside, but you have my concerns in mind. You've heard me. You know that I want to preserve what we have. Ultimately, in the long term, when you're, doing, when you're doing financial planning, maybe it doesn't matter if, your market, if the market goes down 15 or 25 or 30 percent as, you, you, know, as you, you know, the average recession will see you know, a, a loss of 25 to 33 percent. That may not actually even matter to them on their financial planning, but quite frankly, they don't want to lose that money, and I don't want to lose that for them. And it's just better, quite frankly, for revenue in my firm to make sure that we do good by our clients. And so... We started buying these for our clients and then having conversations with our clients about that. And that is my best practice tip for the advisors that are, that are out there. Not just the implementation of them. Quite frankly, I think that that's the easy decision to make. It's an easy decision to make to use these tools. You're protecting your clients on the downside while offering them some, something on the upside. That was an easy decision for us to make. It's going to be an easy decision for us to continue using these tools. Our clients are receptive to them. It's going to help them. But they are a unique product. Not too difficult to understand, not too difficult to explain, but you must reach out to your clients ahead of time. I shouldn't say ahead of time. Shortly thereafter, they're purchased to give them a heads up of what you just bought. And by the way, we do the same thing if we buy small caps in a portfolio 
or if we sell international stocks in a portfolio. A two, three, four sentence type of uh, um, explanation of what we're thinking and why we did will tend to satisfy the, the client in terms of what are you doing in my market. And then you can have much more uh, engaging conversations during your quarterly reviews or however more frequently you end up having them. Um, so that's our story of Berkshire Money Management, why we're using the defined outcome ETFs from innovator funds versus structured products currently, how we're implementing them and why we're implementing them, being able to allow for downside while still offering some upside, and the best practice, in my view, of engaging your client as to what you're doing for them and why doing so is important to them and why it's meaningful. So I'll, that's me wrapping up, and I'll hand off the conversation to Wes Matthews, the Director of Milliman Financial Risk Management. Thanks, Alan. That was great. Appreciate it. Uh, as Trevor mentioned earlier, uh, my name is Wes. I'm at Milliman, and we are the sub-advisor for the Defined Outcome Funds for Innovator. Uh, it's been a great partnership with this whole team uh, and happy to be part of this. Um, so I'm going to dig into a few different frequently asked questions we get on how to implement these strategies. Uh, these are these are questions that pop up somewhat regularly um, regarding uh, liquidity, tradability, how to use these in models, how to trade the funds, how to make that decision, uh, as well as how have they done so far. So I'll start by digging into liquidity. Um, you know, this is something that comes up quite a bit, uh, and while we haven't mentioned it yet, these strategies are built from flex options. Uh, flex options are SIBO listed options that are exchange traded. Uh, but they're flex and that they allow us to set specific strikes uh, and maturity dates. So uh, slightly different from the standard options you might see listed. However, um, that market is easily hedgeable in the sense that the underlying exposure that these funds offer you are the S&P 500. Uh, and just as an example here on the slides, the S&P uh, 500 options, index options, have an open interest of about $4.2 trillion. Uh, on a daily basis. Uh, this is the snapshot we took earlier in the year uh, with an average daily volume of 272 billion um, shares trading, uh, or sorry, value trading um, on a daily basis. And so that's just, that's just one example of how liquid this market is. Um, to take that a step further, we work closely with a bunch of market makers and APs who help us make markets in these funds, um, and they're able to hedge their exposure on the back end uh, with anything that's related to the S&P. So they could do it with options like this that we're showing here. They could do it with um, the actual S&P ETFs that are out there. They could do it with futures. They could delta hedge in a number of different ways. So all that to say is that this is about the most liquid underlying exposure possible for the market maker community to be able to hedge. Um, that being said, um, you know, they've, they've quoted some gigantic numbers in terms of ability to trade large, large blocks and not move this market at all. Um, this screenshot gives you a little bit of an insight into that. So this was when we first launched the 15% buffer product in January, um, showing you that we did about 1.8 million shares uh, in volume that day, uh, and the market barely moved uh, an inch. Um, another example, I don't even have a visual for it, but back in the fall, one of the funds was trading about 40, 50,000 shares a day, and we had a 300,000 unit order come in, uh, and I think it ended up moving it by about half a cent um, in terms of execution. So extremely liquid. Um, so besides that, we'd also um, encourage you all, if you do come in with very large orders, use the resources you have available, um, whether that's your own ETF specialist desk uh, at your firm or your clearing firm. Feel free to ask them. Uh, if you do have orders that are fairly large, they can do block pricing, block trading, uh, where they do creation size. Um, feel free to reach out to Innovator as well. Um, they'll get in contact with our team as well at Milliman, and we can help you through any of those, uh, those, those questions you may have about large orders. Uh, if you do just trade on the secondary market, uh, we always encourage you and remind you to, to use limit orders. Um, market orders can, can cause some problems by, by sweeping through a book. So use limit orders if possible uh, and, and avoid just a general practice tip, but avoid the open or close. Um, there's less stability of pricing those times of day um, and a little bit uh, less volatility in the middle of the day. Uh, to the next slide there, um, this, is, this is one tool that we offer through the Innovator website. It's a way for you to see 
what the current risk reward profile is of any of the funds. So on the site, innovatoretfs.com, you'll be able to pull up any of the buffer products. And you'll see a similar chart to this. Um, this one here is the 15% buffer January issuance. Uh, and I put, just pulled this one up because it has a longer history to it and gives you um, a good visual on, on some of the implementation we'll talk about. So the light blue line there is the S&P 500 index performance over the last basically eight months. Um, and then the dark blue line is the, the buffered ETF performance itself. Um, you can see that gray region and the bottom of the chart is your buffer zone. And then the dotted blue line up top is your cap. So that's kind of the max level of performance you would see over the outcome period for the fund. Uh, I picked this one because uh, I think the tool is very helpful. So if you had bought this day one way back there at zero, you can see that about a month ago, you know, the S&P was up above the cap uh, and you were slowly appreciating towards that line. So this is an example of where if I continued to hold that fund, and let's just say the S&P stayed up there, although right now it's trying to make an argument that it's not going to. Uh, but if it did stay up there, you would slowly appreciate the rest of the, the the time period, about four months left until you reach that cap level. So you, you have a decision to make when you own these funds on a daily basis, um, whether you want to just buy and hold and let them roll over on the annual basis, or do you want to try to be more tactical with them? Uh, there's not a right way. Um, you know, as Alan mentioned, these, these aren't, uh, they don't have to be an overly complex instrument. Um, it's, it's, it's a very efficient instrument in terms of just buying it, letting it reset the cap on an annual basis. Or if you want to be more tactical, like something like this, you could say, okay, uh, you know, I'd rather roll into the next issuance now that I'm already up 10 plus percent here within uh, seven months, six, seven months, uh, and roll into the new series. So there's always going to be that, that question of what to do next with these models. Uh, and the charting tool here is, is really a great way to go about making that decision. It shows your remaining cap, your remaining downside until the buffer, how many days are left, and how they compare. And I know Trevor is going to dig into this a little bit more in, in a few minutes here, but I uh, just wanted to point that out as one of the tools that we work with uh, advisors and portfolio managers to use. Um, another, another thing that I do quite a bit with the innovator group is work with uh, allocators to figure out how to build models around these strategies. Um, and while I, I can't show some of the data here, um, these funds do have um, the 15% and 30% buffer do have a benchmark index that they uh, benchmark against. It is published by SIBO and S&P. Um, and, and that data is available on SIBO website or I'm able to send it to you all as well. But um, a lot of allocators do use uh, that index benchmark data as kind of a proxy to see how this would have done in the past. Um, however, live data on the ETS themselves go back to a little bit over a year right now. Um, one, of the, one of the ways people are using that, that that modeling is to say, you know, how does it compare to just a set it and forget it mentality, leaving it, letting the funds roll on an annual basis, equal allocation to the different quarters, or trying to be more tactical. And I think like anything, you can overthink um, how to use these funds. Um, you, can, you can get uh, paralysis by analysis, some say, by, by overthinking it or overcomplicating it. And the truth of the matter is I've run probably 20, 25 different models with, with Graham and the innovator team. Um, and, and there's not a gigantic margin of difference depending on um, rolling them or being very active. However, there are very obvious situations where let's say I have a 10 cap and I'm at 9.8 and I have a few months left to maturity. Um, it's probably a fair chance to say that it's probably good to roll into the next issuance at that point. You have a new buffer, a new floor reset at that price level, and then you have a new cap that's much higher. Um, the, the really the only thought there would be, do I want to take gains at this point off the table? So more of a tax issue at that point. But um, so obviously we, we're happy to help out with any of those questions you all have. I won't dig into too many specific examples of how we set up models with folks on here, but please feel free to reach out to, to the innovator team if you do. Um, but moving on to the next slide here. Um, this is a, a breakdown of how the ETFs themselves have performed. Uh, in recent market sell-offs. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have time to throw uh, today's sell-off into the mix here, but um, it, it obviously would have a little bit of a blip on the radar compared to these. So um, July, uh, August of this year. So we did have a sell-off um, about three weeks ago. Um, 
two weeks ago, excuse me, and you can see here that the S&P returned about negative 5.6% roughly. And across to the right there, you can see how the different funds held up uh, and outperformed during that time frame. Some more than others, uh, a lot of that will depend on how late in the cycle the fund is. It will also depend on how close to the buffer or cap those funds are at that time. However, it should always be better um, than the actual S&P performance, as you can see there. Uh, December 18 was a, a much larger sell-off going into the new year. S&P was down about 11, a little bit over 11 percent, uh, and the innovator funds were held up very well during that same time frame, capturing about 40, 35 to 50, 60 percent of the downside during that time frame on average. Um, May of this year was another small blip where the market was down uh, 6 percent over a one-month period, um, and the funds were only down between one and a half and, and 480. Um, so you can see that they do their job fairly effectively. And what's nice about the, the defined outcome funds is that since they do carry a basket of options, you always have um, the protection built into the strategy. There are a lot of strategies out there that are reliant on an, an allocator to be active or tactical and decide when there's risk in the market and how to get out. Um, these always have that protection level built in because they're always holding the options basket needed to offer the, the buffer and the cap. Uh, to the end investor, uh, which is a, a significant benefit. Uh, on the next slide, uh, we had our first completion of a cycle. Um, so the July products um, were the first ones to have been issued and complete the full one-year term. And we had a lot of people kind of waiting to see, was it really going to do what it promised to do and set out to do? Uh, and thankfully, um, it did. Um, and we're able to report that it was, as you can see there visually, and then on the page after this in a second here, we'll show you mathematically that it did hold up exactly like it was supposed to over the outcome period. And it was a great example because July started strong last year. Actually, I should clarify, these were issued very early August uh, for the July series, and then reset, they will reset on July every year going forward. Uh, but you can see that the market started to sell off quite a bit, like we just talked about in the December market sell-off. Um, and the funds were down only about half, a little less than half of the sell-off at that point. Um, so they protected you from the major market downturn. And then on the rebound, um, coming up to maturity, they caught up and were right in line with exactly what was um, supposed to be delivered as the underlying outcome minus fund fees. So on slide 16, you can see the mathematical breakdown of, of the performance. And so the power buffer, that's the 15 buffer product, was the 238 versus 291 for the S&P. Um, the only difference in return there would be the, um, the fund fees netted out. However, Every one of these funds um, offered you half the volatility or a little bit over half on the on the buffer product, but a roughly half the volatility uh, with less than half of the maximum drawdown for the power and ultra uh, and about two thirds of the drawdown for the, the buffer product. So significant, um, you know, performance outperformance in the downside uh, by having those buffers in place and reducing your volatility. The Last thing I would add to this too is is that while there are other other funds coming out, I don't think Trevor touched on this, but we are going to roll out the a uh, couple other exposures here in the next month or two, um, which will add some complexity when people say, okay, now you're going to have monthly issuances coming out of all these funds. Um, we have 36 different funds, so we would encourage you to use the website and the tools available on there. Um, the chart's a, a very helpful one, and I know Trevor's going to touch on one other tool as well in a second here, but I'll hand it back over to Trevor, and he can go into that in more detail. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Wes, and, and Alan, you as well. Um, yeah, like Wes just mentioned, just want to kind of give you a quick rundown of what's in the pipeline and what we have next planned for uh, this whole suite of defined outcome ETFs. And really excited for October uh, to get here. We're, we're expanding the lineup from just 9, 15, and 30% buffer levels to actually include a total buffer. Um, so that'll launch October 1st. And what this does, this is gonna provide you 100% buffer. Um, so basically, you won't have any downside exposure if you get in at the beginning of the outcome period. The major difference, however, is the fact that the outcome period, instead of being one year, will now be three years. Granted, you still have all the benefits of the ETF and daily liquidity, so you can get in and out at any point throughout the trading day over the course of that three-year outcome period. However, um, that's just an extension from the existing S&P 500 products. Um, so we're excited to offer that. We believe there are a lot of different applications 
for a total buffer, uh, especially for fixed income replacements. You know, a lot of people are expressing concern. What am I going to do with uh, my bond exposure currently? What are rates going to do going forward? Are we in an inverse yield environment? We think that this solves a lot of what people are looking for in a risk profile of fixed income. So based off uh, consumer demand, we are bringing that out uh, starting this October, and we will be bringing out three different series um, of that going forward. Um, and just to reiterate what and Wes talked about this a little bit, this time next year, we will have 36 of the monthly defined outcome ETFs in the S&P 500. So I um, just want to make that really clear. We started launching these quarterly, and once again, off consumer demand and the appetite for risk management, uh, we decided to go monthly. Um, so just so you're aware, what we have out currently is not a full lineup, but this time next year we'll have January to December with the 9%, 15%, and 30% protection level. Sorry, buffer levels available. Um, one other thing I mentioned is we are also going to expand the international lineup. Uh, there aren't as many options uh, to invest in the ETF space internationally, and we think that this really serves a significant purpose given the volatility that we see um, in international markets. So we'll be expanding quarterly versions of both emerging and international developed markets, and the next one will be rolling out uh, here in October, or the next two, rather. Um, moving forward to the next slide. This, Wes talked about this. I just want to reiterate the tools that are available to you, and you don't have to get in day one of these things. This is not like a structured product where you accumulate assets over the course of a month, and it trades off a QCIP, and then it, you don't get your money back until liquidity. You can buy in and out of these things every single day, and every single day you can know what your current defined outcome is. So at innovatoretfs.com slash define, you can go and you can play around with this pricing tool here where you can see where each of the defined outcome ETFs launched at the beginning of their outcome period and where they're trading currently relative to the market. So that is what we have today. One thing that we are extremely excited to bring out here in the next few weeks um, is basically a hypothetical extension of that pricing tool. Rather than you have to go through and analyze all those 36 plus Define outcome ETFs and figure out where they're trading and which is the, the optimal exposure for you and your outlook for the market. We're going to create a hypothetical tool that's basically going to give you five different scenarios for what could possibly happen with the market. Up 10, up 5, flat, down 5, down 10%. In any of those scenarios, it'll populate what the ETF will do. So not only can you know your outcome before you invest, but also based off of where you think the market's going to go from here, you can choose the defined outcome ETF that suits your, uh, your profile that you're looking for. So very excited to get that out. Uh, we'll make sure that we uh, keep you posted on that. And just as far as communication on our end, if you want to stay updated on all of our defined outcome ETF offerings, uh, we do send a weekly email every single Monday um, that gives you a snapshot of where all the ETFs stand relative to uh, their initial outcome period and current outcome period. Um, that way you can just stay up to date with uh, the current offerings as well as any upcoming offerings that we have in the pipeline. So if you do want to sign up for that, you can do so. Just email rates at innovatoretfs.com and we'll make sure that we start up that communication. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. That wraps up the presentation. We're going to get into Q&A here. we got a bunch of questions coming through and I encourage you to to send those in now if you do have anything else. Um, so we'll start here with this one. There's a question about the, the buffer investment and whether you get it when you invest and that's, or if it's just when the ETF launches. So the way that these operate is, yes, each of them has a initial starting date, which we call the initial outcome period. And that's the, the first one is the day that the ETF actually lists and starts trading on the open market. Going forward, um, the buffer starts from that point, the beginning of the outcome period. If you were to buy in, say, six months of an outcome period, you would have you would not have exactly a 9, 15, or 30% buffer. That buffer and that cap level would have changed, which is why we'd encourage you to go to the pricing tool to go and see what those numbers are currently and what your current outcome would be. 
That being said, each of these trade in perpetuity. They never mature or liquidate. So once that 12-month outcome period ends, those options expire, that outcome period has been realized, we go out and buy another set of 12-month options, and you'll get a fresh buffer and a brand new cap. And the it, ETFs just continue to trade in perpetuity. So you don't even have to sell the ETF. Um, you can actually just hold on to the ETF and the rebalance process happens for you and resets those different levels. Another question for you is, hang on one second. Question is, how can liquidity be assured um, at the maturity date of the fund? Um, if it's near its cap and a client wants to sell to reinvest, why would somebody else buy the fund near its peak? The beautiful thing about the ETF structure is its ability to create and redeem shares. There's, there's not a finite ability. So if there's demand for a product, we can actually create new shares to give you access to whatever defined outcome structure you're looking for. If there is selling, we simply exchange that with an AP and take those shares off of the market. There doesn't need to be secondary liquidity or a buyer necessarily in the secondary market for when you're trying to get out. So like I said, that's just across the board with the ETF structure. Uh, we can create and redeem new shares based off of either uh, more buying or selling. Another question coming through, are you seeing money managers using these funds to replace a portion of fixed income or still part of the equity allocation? I like to call these a Swiss Army knife. It's really across the board, the application, but, uh, but really three parts. Um, the bulk is equity replacement. People are splitting their allocation to the S&P and providing you know, some downside protection with market exposure by kind of pairing to find out from ETFs with their domestic equity exposure. The second, fixed income alternative, and I'd say the third bucket would be as uh, kind of an alternative sleeve. If anybody's running a long short strategy, doing any options work on their own, uh, we've actually even seen people sell some of their commodity exposure and using this to provide that sort of exposure. Okay, hang on, there's one question for, for Alan. I'm here. Hey, I'm Alan. Here. Hey, Alan. Still there? Yep. Hey, do you mind talking about how, where you're using these? Is it just as, uh, are you using that as a portion of fixed income? There's a question specific. <laughs> The, the question came up perfectly just after what you guys are talking about. Thus yeah. far, we've been using it for replacement of equity. We have in our, our more conservative portfolios, we've been, we, we use Schwab as a custodian, and they have what's called the Schwab Value Advantage Money Market, and it's been yielding about two and a quarter percent, which is you know, a fantastic rate. So we've been comfortable using that. We've been uh, considering lately using it as that alternative. So we haven't been comfortable with our more conservative portfolios buying equity. We uh, already had enough bond exposure we felt that was comfortable in there. So we've been considering using it as uh, uh, in our more conservative portion, port, uh, portfolios just because the high yield um, investment money market is beginning to come down with the latest Fed reduction, uh, Fed rate reduction, and then perhaps another one in September. But primarily we've been using it as equity replacement. Fantastic. Thanks, Alan. A lot of questions coming in. Uh, rather than me try to answer each one and read the questions as they're coming in, I, I do want to let you uh, know we do have dedicated sales consultants across the country uh, covering you, and they can be reached here on our general line at 800-208-5212, and we will have each sales representative reach out and answer the questions that are, that are coming through. Like I said, there are a bunch coming through. We'll make sure that we get to each of those. Visit the website, check out the pricing tool, innovatoretfs.com slash define. Really appreciate Alan, Wes, your time, and everybody that uh, was on the call today. Thank you so much. Hopefully it was helpful, and we'll follow up accordingly. Have a good day.